Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to another episode of Fantasy News. I am your disheveled goblin host, Daniel Green, and today we have a delightful selection of fantasy news to make our way through. But first, a small channel update. Do not worry, your regularly scheduled content is coming this week and ever more after. But if you notice, I'm working on smaller projects, mostly just book reviews and fantasy newses, which is already kind of the intent. It's also because I am trying to finish what I started. The part two of the Fringe Deep Dive is currently being worked on. So if you would like to check that on out, I highly recommend you check out part one. I think it's the best video I've ever made. And part two uh, should be out in a couple of months. It is quite the endeavor to do. Feature length projects, they hit different. But with that being said, we're gonna go ahead and jump on into the hardcore fantasy news of the day, beginning as always with some cover reveals. We had a sensational one from Orbit here with The Lotus Empire by Tasha Suri. This is the final book in the Burning Kingdoms trilogy and is due out November of this year with design by Planet Pinto and an illustration by Mika Epstein. I love the vibrancy of this cover, not only in the actual color, but the emotion and so much world building happening that really does seem to hit different than a lot of what is on the shelves these days. It just feels like the end of a trilogy with a book cover. I really dig this one. Damn. Next up for the covers, we have one that I wasn't as big a fan of, but boy did it make up for it with the title, and that would be Between Dragons and Their Wrath by Devin. Madsen. The cover is interesting with a large dragon, darker colors, and that red aesthetic. Certainly neat, but that title, Between Dragons and Their Wrath, love that. It definitely kind of puts dragons into the mindset of being something above, beyond humanity, which is kind of always my favorite way for them to be presented. I really like when dragons feel like somewhere between gods and animals. That's that's a vibe. Between Dragons of the Wrath has art by Mike Heath, AKA Magnus Creative, and design by Von Brooklyn and Planet Pinto, and is described as the start of an epic fantasy series with dragons, magic, and forbidden romance in an empire on the brink of revolution. And this is coming August of 2024. And then for the final cover reveal of the day, we have The Doors of Midnight by R.R. R. Verdi. This book due out August this year is described as myths begin and a storyteller's tale deepens. In this essential sequel to R.R. R. Verdi's breakout Silk Road inspired epic fantasy debut, The First Binding. Some stories are hidden for a reason. All tales have a price. Every debt must be paid. There's a very specific tone hit with this, with the cover and the synopsis and title, where it kind of feels like a little warmer, a little cozier, but also kind of mysterious. And those are some of my favorite stories where it doesn't feel like you're in some grim, dark world. There's some light, there's some levity, there's a focus on beauty, but underlaying it all is those mysteries that a story is going to delve into. And I don't know if that's what this book is about or like, but it certainly succeeds in making me think that's what it's like. Okay, I guess. And then in the strangest story of the day, we have a collaboration on the way between two very well-known names within the sci-fi fantasy space for two very different reasons. China Meville and Keanu Reeves are releasing a collaborative book. To be clear, this is not the first time Keanu Reeves has published, and in fact, this is more of an adaptation or a continuation of a comic he has previously put out called Berserker, but spelled no vowels, <laughs> vowels, which was also a collaborative effort between Keanu Reeves and Matt Kent. And from what I could tell, Berserker was received positively, not overwhelmingly so, but it definitely sold well. And here, China Meville is being brought in to adapt it to a novel format. Titled The Book of Elsewhere and set in the Berserker world, it seems this is going to continue to explore the themes of finding meaning or purpose and immortality. And it will be published the 23rd of July by Penguin. When speaking about this process, Keanu Reeves said, China did exactly what I was hoping for. He came in with a clear architecture for the story and how he wanted to play with the world of Berserker, a world that I love so much. I was thrilled with his vision and feel honored to be 
a part of this collaborative process. If you are unfamiliar with China Melville's work, I highly recommend Perdido Street Station. It is an immensely important, weird read. And something about these two coming together, well, of course, there's tons of conversations about who's exactly coming up with what and, you know, what part of the creative process is who being brought in for. I'm just excited for this on face value and premise, and it makes me want to check out the Berserker comic. If you have, let me know what you thought of it in the comments down below. I definitely want to keep reading comments and manga here on the channel. It's never going to die. Before we get into the Rebel Moon update, a quick word from today's sponsor, a fun project I'm involved with. Goblins, the time has come. You can have your own goblin. Pin, because in partnership with Wild Crown Productions, I'm going to be releasing a goblin pin in collaboration with a bunch of friends of the channel. That's right, this collection is going to contain pins reflecting the channels of myself, Man Carrying Thing, Peru's Project, Patrick Leo, and that undulating woman. So you, if you're a fan of us, can get a full set and have pins representing your love of this little booktube in space. Wild Crown Productions specializes in creating unique and custom crafted merchandise with a variety of creators and influencers and authors made with clo close, close, hard enamel. I don't know how to say that word for superior durability and includes two classes for secure attachment. And of course, there's gonna be a colored Wild Crown logo on the back. Designed by Christina Henson and colored by Heather Shields with feedback from all of us to make sure they reflect our channels exactly how we want them to. These pins can be bought separately for $15 a piece, or you can pick up all the pins in the Booktuber pin pack for 50 US dollars. That means you get each pin for just 10 bucks a piece. And if you do get that complete collection, you also get an additional pin, the Bookworm, thrown in for free. The campaign is going live right now and it's gonna be over February 9th. So if you'd like to go ahead and pick one up, now is your time to do so and so help me God. We are making the Goblin the best-selling pin. If you want the full collection, fine, but if you're going for one, you better not go get the man carrying thing more. I, he, Jake better not outsell me. Jake, no! And now for Rebel Moon. <sighs> because we have had it announced that we are getting Rebel Moon House of the Blood Axe issue one on sale the 10th of this month, 2024. So it's already out. And yes, as a part of the multimedia blitz we are getting to try and make Rebel Moon catch on, not only are we getting books, not only are we getting games, we are also now getting a comic book. Zach, stop trying to make Rebel Moon happen. After looking to reviews, because this is already out, nearly everyone seems to be commenting on something I noticed when I saw the cover for this. It's focusing on characters who are barely in the movie because so many characters are just kind of brought in, stick around, and don't do much. So it's like asking you to care about characters in this expanded universe that they didn't even make you care about in the film. This is so forced. All of this is just trying so hard. None of it feels organic. There's no diehard Rebel Moon fans out there who as soon as they finish the movie were like, those characters need to see more from them right now. And I have this weird theory, totally crazy and I'm sure not right, where they intentionally released a super chopped down down, not very great movie so they could see the early criticisms and then continue to tweak and edit the bigger, larger cut they keep saying is going to be like the definitive Zack Snyder one. And if that's the case, that's even grosser because they just are putting out a product to then get reviews to like then try and make this one somewhat better. But we like know Snyder took some of the criticisms for the original Justice League movie into account for his Snyder cut. So is it that crazy? I don't know. I just know I wish these marketing dollars had possibly gone to a story that was a bit more deserving. And while we're certainly already seeing Rebel Moon in the rear view, in my opinion, I don't plan on talking about it here again on the channel. It just feels like it took someone else's spot at the table, a story that could have been more deserving because a director's name was attached and the studio decided to just go with it. From there though, we have another big author stepping into the Kickstarter space to make headlines. And that would be because Will White's Cradle animation attempt is officially live on the platform and he is trying to gain a minimum of a million dollars to bring you some form of animated adaptation for his Cradle series. Know that this project needs to raise 6.5 million for the full first book in the series to be fully 
animated in two episodes. This first initial goal is purely for a feature-length animatic of Unsold plus a new Cradle short story. That being said though, it has just gone live this morning and in the time of me recording, I've seen it go from 190,000 to 250,000, oh my God. So I'm happy to say later this week, I'm going to be sitting down to interview Will White and his partner on this project and I will be releasing that interview on the channel hopefully next week. I really wanna get into the behinds of scenes of this for Cradle fans, so like, subscribe, all that fun stuff. If you wanna see it, though you're gonna get it no matter what. Unless I die. Now we're gonna be stepping away from the major book news, but don't worry, at the end of this, we're actually gonna be tying back into it to talk about another adaptation coming down the road for Mary Shelley's classic, Frankenstein, with an absolutely insane lineup for its cast. The Maggie Gyllenhaal-helmed project now has cast Annette Bening to act across Jesse Buckley, Christian Bale, Penelope Cruz, and Peter Skarsgård. In this telling of Frankenstein instead of the traditional story, which if you're just based it off the classic movie. That's not very accurate to the story either, so get, get that out of your head. But this reimagining is apparently going to be following Frankenstein's travel to 1930s Chicago to seek the aid of Dr. Euphronis in creating a companion for himself. This project has been long talked about and was certainly delayed by the recent strikes, but I'm really excited for it. Frankenstein, yes, it's a story that at this point kind of feels like beating a dead horse, at least I thought until I've seen some really ambitious reinterpretations, reimagining of this story that was super radical for its time and is now being reused to send radical messages today. And if there's anything that carries on the spirit of Frankenstein well, I believe it is that. So I'm really excited to see this and goddamn, if you attach Annette Bidding, Penelope Cruz and Christian Bale to a project, holy shit. And in an attempt to bring back interest for the Witcher series after the internet has just been dogpiling it ever since Henry Cavill is announced to be leaving for season four. They have announced a pretty awesome casting for season four, I'm going to give them that. And that is because Lawrence Fishburne has joined the Witcher season four as Regis. Not gonna lie, I haven't been a fan of the Witcher show since like season one, but casting Lawrence Fishburne in anything is enough to make me be like, oh, Damn! I have so much nostalgia tied to that man for so many of his movies during my childhood. Not just The Matrix. Lawrence Fishburne's got a hell of a resume and Event Horizon's actually a good movie. Screw you, Red Letter Media. I, I disagree. We're leaving. Speaking of shows though, where I was like, I am done with you, but maybe I need to just give it one more look. Halo season two has released its trailer and I'm not gonna lie, Trailers are lies, but this one did look like a tant tant tantalizing lie. That was a tantalizing lie. It was a good looking trailer. Halo season one also had a good looking trailer. I did not enjoy what I watched of that. I abandoned it before I got to the end, I believe. But I was surprised to see as time has gone on, the overall reviews for the Halo show have evened out to just be below average, not as abysmal as I seem to think. And I want to practice what I preach. Sometimes it takes shows multiple seasons to find their footings. One of my favorite shows of all time, The Next Generation was not very good out the gate. So yeah, for Halo fans, I hope season two corrects course, gets in the proper lane and feels like a better adaptation. And if you were a fan of season one, I hope it keeps what you liked in season one and just makes season two all the better. I think we all agree, every video game fan is going to easily line up and say, yes, deserves an absolutely awesome adaptation, whether animated or live action. I mean, we've seen it done before in short form format, so we know it can be there. And how many years will have to go by before we can get another attempt if this one fails? Who knows? So I'd rather see this one find its footing and manage to find some success than just overall crash and send a message to Hollywood that this franchise can't work. And while there seem to be some real stinkers of episodes, I mean, Jesus, episodes seven on IMDb as a 4.6, and IMDb is pretty generous with their ratings, but the final episode of the season has the highest rating of the season, so I hope it did end on an angle that allows them to pivot and do better for fans all around. But I promised you we would come back into the hardcore book news, and you better bet your butt we're doing that here today. Because Tor.com, one of the most recognizable names within the book publishing space, specifically for science fiction and fantasy in America and the UK, I believe, is going to be rebranding to Reactor, debuting a new site on January 
2023. With this announcement from Tor reading, Tor Publishing Group announced today that Tor.com will become Reactor on January 23rd, 2024, coinciding with the launch of a completely redesigned website. Since its foundation in 2008, Tor.com has become a leader in coverage of science fiction and fantasy books and pop culture with over 3 million visits per month. As an online magazine, Tor.com has won countless awards and has been the Locus Award winner for Best Magazine for seven years running. And this comes with a whole bunch of new social media accounts for you to follow as well if you want to stay even more up to date than I can possibly keep you here in the weekly fantasy news wrap up. I think the most important takeaway from this though is caught about halfway through the announcement where they say, the site has been publisher agnostic since its founding and the new name will reflect its independence from Tor Publishing Group. The short fiction program will continue under the reactor name and in addition to the daily commentary on science fiction, fantasy and related subjects that readers have come to expect, the site will also now cover all aspects of the genre, including horror, romance and more. Actually it said and and more. Hey Tor Publishing Group, you have a typo in your account. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, my first initial reaction to this was kind of like, ooh, I don't like change. But I don't think they'd be doing this if it didn't make sense on a whole lot of levels. Getting rid of brand recognition is a dangerous move and Tor trying to shift towards this new reactor thing could go poorly. But there's potential here. I think there's a lot of potential here. And I think this is a sign of the internet's evolution as a whole right now, where social media is being backed away from more and more and more, where that used to be the default place to go to get these news. In my experience, very much so just my own personal anecdotal evidence, more people are looking for websites that are not social media to go to, to get their updates, to get their news. They want something that doesn't have all that baggage. And breaking away from the restrictions that the name Tor come with and trying to be a more new neutral place, that could be big business in the future. And I respect it. I'm not saying it's guaranteed success or failure, but it's an interesting business move. And one I will be keeping my eye on and would be happy to kind of support if I think they're doing good work. So cool on you, Tor. I think this is a really neat endeavor. And while I've been begging so many publishers to try and get more up to date, more evolved to keep pace with how the publishing industry as it changes, this seems like a step in the right direction. And to come even more to the defense of Tor than I thought I would be here. I'm seeing some people in like their announcement tweets saying, oh, you guys are selling out. It looks like you're gonna be trying to just become like another everything website. Tor, as they say in this article, has been publisher agnostic and this React Tor, I think they're going for step, uh, is just them trying to position themselves to be continually putting out the same content, but not under the shadow of the publishing arm. Its ability to grow is no longer restricted by being under Tor, and instead it can just become a place, kind of like fantasy news, where you just get your sci-fi fantasy news with a publishing bend. But this has just been your latest episode of Fantasy News. Like and subscribe if you have not already, and go to the link in the description if you wanna get yourself some badass wild crowned pins and make the goblin come out on top. Thank you everyone so much, and have a good one, y'all. Peace. And I'd like to give a special shout out to my latest high tier patron, Monty Adkins.